Good morning and welcome to St. James. My name is Ben. I'm the senior pastor here. And it is great to have all of you with us this morning, both those on campus and online as we worship our God and our King together today. Got some announcements, some things going on that I want to make you aware of. The first of those is if you are on campus today, we'd love for you to register your attendance. You can do that by either signing uh, in on the welcome pad that's in the back of the narthex, or you can scan that QR code on your bulletin. That's the easiest way to do that, and it's a good way for us to know who's here on Sundays. And if you're online, just say hello to each other. Just uh, drop a comment and say, good morning, welcome, we're glad that you're with us. If you're going to be joining us on campus, I would love it if you would wear your church name tags every Sunday. That'd be super. It's a great way for us to be welcoming to our first-time guests. And every Sunday, we've got new folks here, and, and we want to welcome them and make them feel at home. And name tags really take, uh, take some of the heat off of not knowing somebody when you can see their name. So we'll get you a name tag. All you have to do is contact Jan. You see her email address there. She'll print it out, have it ready for you, and you can pick it up next Sunday right down at the Welcome Center. I, I would also recommend that you get yours not with my name on it, okay? You don't, yours don't have to say Ben Chrisman. You can say your name. All right, friends, we've got a book fair going on today for our learning center. So that is one of our programs here at the church, and they're having their annual Scholastic Book Fair as a fundraiser. If you're looking to get some early Christmas gifts or just some, some gifts for your children, grandchildren, I'd encourage you to swing over to our learning center wing. They're going to stay open through about 1230 today. So right after church, if you want to head over there, you can do some shopping for that. Our choir is beginning their Carols and Candles guest singer rehearsals this Wednesday at 6 p.m. So if you have wanted to be a part of our big Christmas performance and worship service called Carols and Candles, but you're not ready to commit to being a full member of the choir, this is a great way to kind of dip your toe in those waters. So you can just be a seasonal singer and you just meet this fall and then prepare for that Sunday concert that I'm so looking forward to already. I also want to remind you about our blessing of the animals that's coming Sunday, October the 2nd from 3.30 to 4.30 out here on the front lawn. I want you to read the fine print, please. No venomous pets. It's important to read the fine print, friends. As one of the chief pet blessers, I would prefer that we don't have any venom to deal with. But we love your dogs, your cats, your birds, whatever you've got, bring them up here for a special blessing. That's a yearly tradition here at St. James, and I'm looking forward to it. We're hosting an AARP driving course this Wednesday. If you are interested in some uh, specifically designed for drivers age 50 and older, you can get insurance premium discounts if you do this course, depending on your insurance provider. So maybe worth the $20, $25 registration fee. Again, that's this Wednesday at 830. Our children's ministry is hosting a children's Sunday on October the 16th. So in worship, we'll have children in, leading us in music and in some of the written word and liturgy. They'll be serving as greeters and ushers, and we're so excited about that coming up on October the 16th. And I'm also excited about our children's ministry fundraiser. They're selling our church shirts to raise money for the children's ministry. So let me make sure that you hear what I'm saying. These are not children's ministry specific shirts. These are shirts for the whole church. You can kind of see what they look like. They have our, our, our mission statement to know Jesus Christ and to make him known right there. You can get a t-shirt, a long sleeve t-shirt, a hoodie. If you pre-register at that website that you see right there, or you can go to our website for a link to that as well. And then finally, friends, just a few minutes ago, we showed you this video of our art hallway. And I want to remind you that we have brought back the art hallway after several years of COVID. And it's constantly being updated. Denise Luft is our art hallway coordinator. And she's always finding great artists to come and to be a part uh, of the life of the church. And so I encourage you to swing by. It's immediately out here to my left as if you're going to the learning center or going to the nursery. It's a great addition to our church to see some beautiful art and also, if you're looking for something new for your home, all those, many of the pieces are for sale. So I wanted to remind you of that as well. Friends, it's good to be with you today as we worship our God and our King. Let's take a moment this morning to prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of God as we listen to the voluntary.
Good morning. My name is Jessica, and I'm the senior associate pastor. I invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship this morning. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. I'm Reverend Greg Schick, happy to be with you in worship today here in the room and of course you watching online. As we prepare our hearts to, for prayer, you can see there in our bulletins uh, some names of people that we knew of at the time of this printing that we want to be in prayer for, the Parker family, uh, Fred Reed's family, and of course Ross Honey passed away this past week. Uh, Ross. Uh, and Lolly uh, got to St. James just like one beat after St. James started. Almost charter members, I know we all think about them as being charter members, but they were just like the next day, maybe even just, they were so close. But Ross sang from right up there for years and years and years and years. And we love him, of course, and uh, how much they have been present for St. James, helping it make it go for so many years. That service is going to be on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. I know you'll be praying for their family as well as these other families here. I want to invite you to bow your head and be still as we prepare our hearts to pray, to be still so that we might know God in prayer, to still our hearts 
to be still. Holy God, there are some of us in the room where this is the first time that we have been still this week. Because of the demands of the world, of the hustle and the bustle and all that we have going on, we forget to be still, to stop, to breathe, to think, to ascend, and to pray. And so, Lord, for those of us who have yet to be still this week, as we gather here in this sacred space that is set aside for, yes, loud singing and for God's word to be proclaimed, for the noise in the room as we gather and have fellowship before we begin, but also to be still together, to remind ourselves that it's here where we can stop and spend precious and sacred time with you. Lord, we can be still anywhere, not just here. Give us that desire to be still. God, thank you that in doing so, we can push out of our minds and out of our hearts all the things that crowd us to remember who you are and whose we are that we can remember, God, of your love and your grace and how it comes to us to help us, to comfort us, not in just days where we have joy and everything's going great, but even in moments where we hear bad news and things are hard. God, thank you that you are a God that never leaves us or abandons us, but that you're always willing to be with us when we are still and yes, when we are moving. God, thank you for the gift of Jesus who comes to us by way of your Holy Spirit when we call. Thank you for the chance for us to be able to worship in spirit and in truth here in this place. God, thank you for this family of faith that we are surrounded by, both ones that are present and yes, those who have gone on to be with you. Lord, we love you. We love your love. We love the gift of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Today we are wrapping up our sermon series based around the parables of Jesus. We've been walking for the last few weeks through the stories Jesus told, the, the parables, the sayings, the teachings of Christ. And if we just stop for a second and, and allow ourselves a moment of reality, that the miraculous nature of the fact that here we are in Little Rock, Arkansas in 2022, listening to and reading the words of a Jewish teacher from the Middle East 2,000 years ago is nothing short of miraculous to me. That here we are still listening to the teachings of Jesus. And what's even more miraculous is that those teachings over the last 2,000 years have changed lives and led people to salvation over and over and over again. For the last 2,000 years. God has been working in and through these teachings of Jesus. And it's my hope that God would work again today in your heart and in your life as we listen to the words of Christ for us. I invite you to close your eyes, take your, whole, take your hands and place them on your lap. If you're near family or people you feel comfortable taking hands with, I invite you to do that, to hold each other's hands. If not, know that you are, are spiritually holding the hands of your brothers and sisters. And if you're worshiping online today, know that you are holding the hands of the congregation that is gathered here. As we bask in the presence of God, let us turn our hearts and our minds into the presence of our Savior. Repeat this prayer after me so that it becomes our prayer united together. Gracious God, in the silence of this moment, Prepare our hearts and minds to hear your word for us this day. Work your will in our lives. Amen. Much of the entertainment that we consume, the movies that we watch and the TV shows that we sit down for, are rather predictable. We know as soon as we sit down that there's a procedure that the show or the movie is going to follow. We get introduced to the good guys and the bad guys, and we kind of have an idea of who's going to win in the end, right? If we sit down to watch a, a, a crime procedural show, maybe a Law and Order or a CSI, we know that in the first act we're going to be introduced to the crime that's been committed, and then we're going to meet the, the cast of potential criminals. And then our really good-looking detectives, man and woman, are going to solve the case, put the bad guy behind bars, and we all get to move on, right? We know. We know when we sit down that that's exactly what's going to happen, and we watch them anyway, right? I know, a confession moment, I know that every single Hallmark Christmas movie is going to end the same way. And I know that because I've watched a lot of them, okay? That's the confession piece of this statement, right? As that I know is that there's going to be a cute boy and a cute girl, and that they're going to get to know each other. And there's going to be some reason why they can't be in a relationship, but they're going to overcome all the odds, and they're going to end the picture madly in love, and they're going to kiss as the snow is falling down on the Christmas tree, perfectly off-center, just love. I know! And yet I can't wait to watch them again, right? They're coming down the pipe. But the stories that stick with us are not the ones that we can predict, the, the stories that really stick with us, the ones that really are ones that we cling to and turn to are those where there is some break in the predictable, where there is some twist or turn that turns us upside down, and we are now trying to figure out who is really who, and we're left with oftentimes more questions than answers. Those are the stories that really grip us. Well, friends, I had that experience over the last few weeks as I was preparing for today's sermon. Because whenever I've read the parable that we find in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27, when you just glance at it, it looks an awful lot like another parable. You see, in Matthew, there's a parable called the parable of the talents. And it's a remarkably similar story to this parable found in, in Luke chapter 19 called the parable of the pounds. And if you weren't really paying attention, you could be easy to think, oh, they're just the same parable, just, just Luke's version, Matthew's version, and just move on. But the reality here, friends, is that they're vastly different. And when I really stopped to read this version in Luke, I had a lot of questions that I needed to find answers to. And so I want to read it to, together this morning. You can follow along on your screen or in your Bible as I read the text aloud. 
It says, as they were listening to this, he went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So he said, a noble man went to a distant country to get royal power for himself and then return. He summoned 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 pounds and said to them, do business with these until I come back. But the citizens of his country hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. When he returned, having received royal power, he ordered these slaves to whom he had given the money to be summoned so that he might find out what they had gained by trading. The first came forward and said, Lord, your pound has made 10 more pounds. He said to him, well done, good slave, because you've been trustworthy in a very small thing, take charge of 10 cities. Then the second came saying, Lord, your pound has made five pounds. He said to him, and you rule over five cities. Then the other came and said, Lord, here is your pound. I wrapped it up in a piece of cloth, for I was afraid of you, because you are a harsh man. You take what you did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. He said to him, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked slave. You knew, did you, that I was a harsh man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow? Why then did you not deposit my money into the bank? Then when I returned, I could have collected it with interest. He said to the bystanders, take the pound from him and give it to the one who has ten pounds. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten pounds. I tell you, to all those who have, more will be given. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But as for these enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and slaughter them in my presence. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Is that Jesus? I mean, that, that's a pretty harsh message, isn't it? I mean, look at that last line. But as for these enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and let me slaughter them in my presence. That's not what it says in the parable of the talents in Matthew. The parable of talents in Matthew lines up to be the same, that there's a Lord who gives money to three servants, and they're to take it and they're to use it and to multiply it, right? And then they're to find out what happens when the Lord comes back. This is where, friends, the audience matters. Who Jesus is talking to when he offers a parable is incredibly important. In the audience in Matthew, the parable of talents, Jesus is talking to the disciples, to his faithful followers. And he's encouraging them, saying, you've been given gifts by God to use to build God's kingdom, to do incredible things, and I need you to take what you've been given and to go and allow God to multiply it. It's a lesson for us not to hide the gifts that we've been given, not to, not to stick our hands in the sa- heads in the sand when it comes to our work for God's kingdom. This parable, although bearing a similar format, is told to an incredibly different audience. Who Jesus is talking to here is not his disciples. It is not his followers. But instead, it's a group of people who are longing for Jesus to become something that he's not. It's a group of people who are longing for Jesus to become a revolutionary Messiah who will raise up an armed insurrection against the Roman imperial nation that has conquered and sat on Israel for years. They want Jesus to be a military leader, to be their new king, to rise up and free them from Roman oppression. And quite frankly, they're mad. Not only are they anticipating Jesus being something he's not, they're mad about what happened in the verses 1 through 10 of chapter 19. Because in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 19 is the famous story of Zacchaeus, the Israelite who betrayed his own people to go and work for the Roman occupation as their tax collector. They were deemed as some of the most vile people in ancient history. And what did Jesus do to this tax collector? Did he scold him? Did he reprimand him? Did he call him to the carpet? No, Jesus said, I want to eat with you, sinner, and I want to save you. And so the people who are fomenting insurrection, who are desperate for Jesus to overthrow the Romans, are quite perturbed at Jesus for dining with one of their enemies, for having the audacity to eat dinner with Zacchaeus. And so it's to this crowd, to this group of people, that Jesus offers this parable. 
Do you want to know what a kingdom is like, Jesus says? Do you also notice something? We've been paying attention to the parables. Most of the times, how does Jesus start? Most of the time, he starts by saying the kingdom of God is like, right? And then he tells you the parable. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like is like a tree, a lantern on a hill. The kingdom of God is like this. And he tells the story of the good Samaritan or the prodigal son. He didn't do that here. If you pay attention to Luke, it never says that Jesus doesn't say the kingdom of God is like. He just says, let me tell you a story. This is Jesus' rebuttal to what it is they're asking him to do. You say you want a king. You say you want a military overthrow of the Romans, but you know what kings do, Jesus says. You know that they go and they get power and they trample on the poor and they take what's not theirs and they beat you up and they slaughter you and they lead you astray. Jesus says, I know what kind of kingdom you think you want, but that's not what I'm here to offer. You know, sometimes, friends, we learn about something by finding out what it is. And other times we learn by finding out what it's not. And this last parable is a parable that teaches us what the kingdom of God is not like to help us have a better understanding of what it is like. So I invite you to turn to the back of your bulletin if you want to follow along with me. There are some sermon notes if you want to fill in the blanks there. It's always good and helpful for me to do that. The first thing we see is the kingdom of God is not motivated by greed or power. Jesus lays out that the kingdoms of this world are motivated by greed and power. That one man gets power for himself, even though no one wants him to be in power. Those who stand in his way, he kills. He takes what is not his. And the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Greed and power. And what Jesus is saying is the kingdom that he's building, the kingdom of God that he's ushering in, is nothing like that. And we have evidence of that, not just in what Jesus says, but in what Jesus does. That throughout Jesus' life, we see nothing but, but serving and offering and outpouring and giving so that those who have little can have more, so that those who are broken can be healed, so that those who are lost and on the outside can come in. The kingdom that Jesus is building is not one based on isolating power for the few, wealth for the one, but in abundance and fullness for all. You see, friends, the question that this text is asking us, the question that Jesus is asking us, is what kingdom are we going to belong to? Are we going to be citizens of the kingdom of God who live and act as Jesus did? Or are we going to be citizens of the kingdoms of this world who live and act as these kingdoms do? And we have to ask ourselves the questions of when do we let power and greed motivate our decisions? When do we let our desire to have social capital, to have position in place, to have more money, to have more things, to have more of what we want in the world, when do we allow those desires to overcome and overshadow our desires for the other's benefit and for what God wants us to do? It's not fun to have these thoughts. It's not fun to take this inventory, but it's important for us to understand. When are we getting what we want at the expense of someone else? When do I get Ben's way? And as a result, everyone else has to bend to my will. That's what it's like to be a citizen of the world. And what Jesus is outlining for us is that that kingdom has nothing of benefit for us. But that the kingdom of God has something of benefit for us all. There's good news for everyone. And so we have to ask ourselves, where are our priorities? Where are our actions? Are we putting our time, our energy, and our resources where our mouth and our heart is? The second thing we see here that I think is really important is that the kingdom of God is not motivated by vengeance. Now this one's a little bit hard for us to grasp as 21st century Christians living in America. But the crowd that Jesus was talking to were angry at the Romans. And not just like, I don't like the Romans. They were violently, vehemently angry at the Roman occupiers. When the Roman government came in and occupied the Jews, they implanted their, their way of life, their money, their taxes, and their soldiers. And the Israelite way of being was under threat. 
And so these angry Israelites who are hoping that Jesus will become some military leader to free them from this occupation want vengeance. They don't just want to be free. They want to punish the Romans. They don't just want their own independence. They want to kill the Romans in charge. There is vengeance and there is malice and there is vitriol in their hearts. And what Jesus says is that there's no room for that vengeance in the kingdom of God. There's no room for that kind of hatred. And we see this in the fact that just a few days later, when Jesus was confronted by the full violence of the Roman Empire, as the soldiers hit him and whipped him and spat on him, hung him on a cross, his response was not to strike back. His response was not to lash out. but His response was to silently suffer for the forgiveness of your sins and mine so that we might have life eternal and life abundant, so that we might be free from the gates of hell. It's a suffering model that Jesus offers for us. One that says power and dominion and vengeance and retribution have no room. And friends, that's really hard for us. Because while we may not have the Roman Empire that occupies our lands, is that we all have enemies. And you've got somebody in your heart and in your life who drives you crazy, who makes you angry. And maybe it's a long-standing enemy or maybe it's a short-standing enemy. I don't care what it is, but we all have enemies. And Jesus' command is for us to love our enemies, but that's really difficult for us. And we live in a world, friends, and this has become increasingly more dangerous over the last five years. We live in a world and a society that I believe is better at making enemies for us than we've ever experienced before. Is it between the media that we consume on television, on the internet, between social media and the way that we talk to each other there, we are better at identifying the differences in each other and then villainizing and demonizing each other for those differences. It is an epidemic and it's dangerous and it's tearing us apart. We have gotten better at making enemies than we've ever been and that's not good. We are consistently finding why, reasons why because someone doesn't look like us, dress like us, act like us, talk like us, someone who doesn't have the same socioeconomic background as us, somebody who votes differently than we do, whatever the difference is between people. We have become a people who allow those differences instead of saying we agree to disagree or we, we can't agree on that and move on. We've allowed those things to become reasons why we should find an enemy in that person. It's dangerous, friends. And it's so pervasive and it snuck up on us and I don't think we realized it. I don't think we realized that that's what's happening. I don't think we, we understood or we would have said no. Somewhere along the lines, we would have said, no, we don't want to have that many enemies. I don't want to have that many people that I hate. I don't want to look at people that way. But it snuck up on us and now it's here. And yet Jesus has said to us very clearly to love your enemies. And I'm bad at it. You know why? Because I've settled for something less than. I'm bad at loving my enemies because I've settled for tolerating them. I'm bad at loving my enemies because I've settled for keeping them at arm's length. I'm bad at loving my enemies because I've settled for ignoring them. And if they're out of sight, they're out of mind, and I can just keep on in them, keep them as enemies. And Jesus never says anywhere in Scripture to tolerate your enemies. Jesus never says anywhere in Scripture to keep your enemies at arm's length. Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And let me tell you a secret, friends. I'm of the opinion that you can't love somebody and them stay your enemy. It's impossible. It's impossible. The world is good at creating enemies for us. And what God has called us to is to overcome the world, to overcome the brokenness and the systems that exist in our society today and to stop demonizing each other, to stop villainizing each other, to allow our differences, yes, to be differences, but to acknowledge each other's sacred worth, 
to find a way that we can love one another as God has called us to love. But what's our motivation for that? Because that's a gargantuan ask. I get it. It's a gargantuan ask for me. So there's got to be some motivation, right, besides just Jesus said so. Because that's hard. I'm, I'm, I, he's asking a lot of us. And that motivation is found right before Jesus starts this parable. And so our third and final point today, what Jesus said is the kingdom of God is marked by a desire to seek and save the lost. When the angry crowd confronts him about dining with Zacchaeus, Jesus says, my kingdom has come to seek and save the lost. That's all I'm here to do. My kingdom has come to seek and save the lost. Whoever the lost are, whether the lost are tax collectors or Pharisees, whether the lost are young or old, whether the lost are men or women, whether the lost are, are, are progressive or conservative, whether the lost are rich or poor, I have seek to come and save the lost. That's what Jesus says his kingdom is about. That's its mission statement. And you know why that's so important? It's because I believe that if we take that seriously, that our goal is to seek and save the lost, those 50% of people who live within five miles of St. James who don't believe in Jesus Christ at all, that if our desire is to seek and save those who are hurting, who are lost, who are lonely, and we who also may be people that we've seen as enemies in the past, also may be people that we've villainized, also may be people that villainize us, that if we can engage them in the loving relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord, and we come and we feast at the same table, that there's no room for enemies. Because when we sit together at God's table with every knee bowed and every heart confessing the love of Jesus Christ, finding salvation in his arms, there is no room for enemies. Because there's only room for love. There's only room for grace. There's only room for hope. There's only room for something to move forward in God's kingdom. Friends, it's built on our desire to seek and save, to find and transform, to build up and encourage, to take the lost and the hungry and the hurting and to bring them into the transformation of Jesus Christ so that they can be remade in Christ's own image, remolded, to be the people God has created us to be. Friends, this is the best news in the world. It's the best news in the world. That God loved you so much, he was willing to die for you so that your sins might be forgiven. It's the best news there is. Let's be a people who take that news to the world, to seek and save the lost with the love of Jesus Christ. Friends, let's build that kingdom and become citizens of it. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was son of our crucified. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. Today, friends, we are honoring our Kids Life and Learning Center staffs. If you're not familiar with our great programs we have here for child care at St. James, I want to catch you up to speed. Uh, we have a learning center that is, uh, care, is for daycare and preschool, provides infant care all the way through pre-K-4. It is one of the most highly thought of, uh, thought of programs in Little Rock. In fact, they've won multiple best of the best in Little Rock Awards for early childhood care. They've got a great team of teachers down there who do an exceptional job of preparing students in safe and, and practical ways and in a warm and Christian environment uh, to go off to school. And so we're so thankful for our learning center and not only is it a great program, but it's a successful program. And we've found that they've got some really great leadership that we're so very thankful for. In addition to that, we have our Kids Life program, which is for children who are in kindergarten through fifth grade. And during the summer, it's a summer day camp style program. And in the school year, it's an aftercare program. And it began in 1994 with one volunteer here at the church, Laverne Cahey, and her dedication to provide a safe uh, and Christian environment for children after school. And she saw a need, and she met it. And it's developed into a really incredible program uh, that makes a difference in the lives of children all over our city. Both of these programs, both the Learning Center and Kids Life, are also great entry points for many families into the life of our church. As they feel comfortable taking their kids here for school during the week, they feel more comfortable uh, coming on Sunday morning. And we're deeply thankful uh, for the ministry of our Kids Life and Learning Center programs. So I know we've got some representatives from those programs who are here today. I'm going to invite them to stand if they would, if they feel comfortable doing that. I'm gonna, you're going to do it because I love you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we're going to recognize them today. Thank you guys so much. Friends, I know that, that oftentimes the programs like these, if you don't have little kids, you may not even know that that's happening. But five days a week, these programs are using this incredible facility and, and lives are being changed in and through them. And for that, we are deeply thankful. And friends, as we move into our time of offering this morning, there are lots of programs and ministries that happen here at St. James throughout the week. Seven days a week, something is happening here. Whether it's a, a women's Bible study or an Alcoholics Anonymous group or our children's ministry or youth activities, there's always something happening. And so when you give, when you make your contribution to God through St. James, you are a part of all of those things. Things that you may have no idea are going on. You're a part of all the lives that are being changed in and through those ministries. And I can't thank you enough for your continued generosity. And I ask that you would continue to find ways to offer your blessings and your thanks to God through your financial generosity. Let's take a time to pray for our offering. Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks today for the blessings that you pour out into our lives, for the love that you bring to us and through us. God, help us to be your people who offer our time, our energy, and our resources for your kingdom's benefit. God, we love you, and we give thanks for all that you do. Receive the gifts that are offered today, and may they be our act of worship for you. Amen.
Friends, this time I'd like to invite my friend Katie to come forward this morning as she will be joining our congregation transferring uh, from another United Methodist Church in Batesville. Uh, we are excited to have Katie with us. She's had some conversations with me over the phone and shared her deep desire to be a part of the life of this church. And I'm so thankful uh, that she is going to be joining us in full membership this morning. And so, Katie, I ask you these questions. Will you be loyal to St. James United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Amen. Let us rejoice and welcome Miss Katie as a new member of our congregation. I'm so glad. Thank you. Absolutely. You do. Yes, ma'am. You've done, you've done perfectly. If you would like to introduce yourself to Miss Katie, I would invite you to do so. She's a delightful person after the service is over uh, and just share with her the welcome that she is, or how welcome she is to be a part of the life of faith of St. James. Friends, if any of you have a decision that you'd like to make to, to follow Jesus Christ, to enter into his love and allow him to be your savior, or if you desire uh, to become a member of St. James United Methodist Church. I invite you to find any one of the pastors after the service is over or to reach out to us throughout the week. We love getting phone calls and hearing from you if you have any questions. Friends, it's good to be with you. I invite you to stand together as we sing our closing hymn, number 131, We Gather Together. Hear now this blessing. Go forth into all the world, and may the stranger find in you a generous friend. Take with you the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And remember this, God loves you always, and there's nothing you can do about it. Go in peace, my friends. Go in peace. Amen.